Joining me now, live from Netroots Nation 2012 in Providence, Rhode Island, is Abe Bonowitz. He is the Director of Affiliate Support for the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. Abe, thanks for joining me. Uh, greetings, glad to be here. Uh, so, Abe, now, I know over the past, um, and, and I want to talk about the, the issue, well, let, let's talk about, uh, let's start with the state of the death penalty in this country. It seems to me that we're starting to see some progress that we hadn't seen really over the past, I don't know, decade. Well, yeah, our organization has been around for 35 years. We were started in the wake of the Gregg decision in 1976, which um, upheld new death penalty laws that were written after the Furman decision in 72, struck down all the death penalty laws. So. You know, it's been quite a struggle, and through the 90s, we had almost 100 executions some years. Um, but now, we're actually starting to win. We have, in the past five, five years, seen five states abandon the death penalty. New York, New Jersey, New Mexico, Illinois, and just a few weeks ago, Connecticut. Connecticut. Um, and sitting right across the aisle from us is the Speaker of the Connecticut House, who helped make that happen uh, during an interview with somebody else. So it's... Um, you know, it is a, uh, it, it's an issue that more and more people are understanding, you know, politicians are understanding it's not the third rail, uh, but more important, people are getting, regardless of where you stand on whether or not we should kill murderers, that the system isn't working, that the system can't be trusted, that it's a terrible waste of money, uh, but we can do better for victim family members, we can do better for law enforcement and give them better tools to actually prevent crime and solve unsolved crimes rather than waste the money on something that we're not really using anyway. Has the, have the gains in terms of, uh, for those of us who um, oppose the death penalty, have the, games been, the gains been a function of technology? I mean, uh, just, uh, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, I saw a report that showed thousands of people have been wrongly incarcerated and have later released. Now, those weren't, That's right. those weren't new... death penalty, uh, 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 those, pre those weren't death penalty cases, but if you, can make a, if you can make a mistake in any case, you can make a mistake in a death penalty case. Well, exactly, and, and that, that is a new database that was just launched that, um, that is looking at all exonerations. Um, we focus, of course, on people exonerated who were sentenced to death. Um, I'll note that of the 140 on the official list, I think only 14 or 15 were DNA exonerations. So in other words, it took DNA to get them off. But um, in most of the cases, it's some other you know, mistaken witness identification, uh, uh, police misconduct, a, a combination of a number of things. They, uh, but luckily, there was some mechanism for uh, for that challenge to be looked at. So, but technology is a part of it. Really, what's happening is people are just realizing it's not working. It's a failed public policy. I mean, that, that, that's and, fascinating to me because um, I would have imagined that it was a function of DNA, that it was technology, and that was changing it. So, what is happening? Are there? Are there more instances where people are going back and trying to exonerate people? Is it, I mean... Well, the innocence issue is one that's a very powerful issue for our movement, for people especially that aren't yet with us opposed to the death penalty. Um, and we actually have a campaign about that, shoutingfromtherooftops.org uh, is the webpage, which actually that comes from Justice Scalia in 2006 in an opinion actually wrote that if there was, if it was proven that, that we had executed a person who was innocent, they'd be shouting his name from the rooftops. So we're starting to do that. Cameron Todd Willingham, Carlos de Luna, uh, we can't say he's absolutely innocent, but Troy Davis was, you know, the, the task tag with that was too much doubt. Um, and, and that's, those are the things that have really exploded this movement in a way, especially the Troy Davis case, uh, if you want to talk about technology. Right. You know, the, the night he was killed, Troy Davis and the hashtag too much doubt were trending topics on Twitter. Okay. Interesting. And, I mean, this, so what we're seeing, and, and when we see the rollback of uh, the death penalty, it really is mostly about the notion of its efficacy, right? I mean... You know, there's, there, as opposed to, I find it philosophically abhorrent. Um, uh, but the it seems that there hasn't been a 
massive change in that, but there is a far great, there has been a change in terms of the perception that it just doesn't work. The, exactly, and, and really what is starting to move it is the fact that actually conservatives and other unlikely allies are coming to the table. I mean, this is the only issue that you see, one of the only issues you see the ACLU and the Catholic Conference sitting together at the uh -huh. table on. Okay, but we have uh, a number of conservatives that have taken this on. In Kansas, the bill that's going to be running uh, this coming upcoming legislative session is sponsored by Republicans, and for them, it's a fiscal issue. And for some of them, it's also their pro-life, Catholic, or otherwise. And um, and for them, it's about being consistently pro-life. But uh, but the the main impetus for that bill was the budget cutting that they have to do, and the recognition that it, you know when a when a county prosecutor decides that he or she is going to seek a death sentence, they're going to spend a bunch more money, and it's a crapshoot because half of all death sentences are overturned during the appeals process. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could be wasting all that money eventually, and. You know, in California, we're coming up in November, we're going to see a ballot initiative. It's called the Safe California Campaign. They, they have figured out that they're going to spend, if California does not abolish the death penalty, it's going to spend a billion dollars in the next five years just to maintain its death row of more than 700 people. How long have you been working for uh, the uh, death for the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty? I've been working for about four years as an employee. I was on their board previously. I've been a, a supporter and a member of the organization since I got involved involved in this in the, in the late 1980s. So. Did you think at that time that the, the push and the momentum to uh, abolish the death penalty would be driven by an issue like cost and efficacy, or did you think that? Well, I tell you, for me, I came to this issue as a person ready to pull the switch myself. I was for the death penalty. Um, and yeah, I went to a meeting on the campus of Ohio State University of a group called Amnesty International, and there was a speaker. I had heard about Amnesty as a group that tries to free prisoners of conscience, you know, people in prison for their beliefs and their religion. I was down with that, but there was a speaker talking about the death penalty in the United States. And I said, well, this is the United States. We have the best justice system in the world. If we have the death penalty, it's fine with me. I'll pull the switch myself. And I set out to try to prove those people wrong. And in doing so, I found, found out everything I believed about the death penalty, the truth was the opposite. Uh. And the thing that literally jumped me from one side of the fence to the other was learning that you have to kill on a county that can afford a death penalty trial. I'm from Ohio is where I grew up. And, and in Ohio, you got to kill somebody in Hamilton County, Franklin County, Cuyahoga County, that's Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, Toledo, Akron, um, Dayton, the big cities. Those counties have enough tax revenue to pay for a death penalty trial. The rural counties can't afford it, and therefore you can't get a death sentence. Except in Ohio, the only condition uh. where the state pays for the trial is if the murder occurs in a state institution, such as a prison. So Fascinating. for me, it was this question of fairness. You cross the county line and you can't, and you can't get the ultimate punishment. I thought that was wrong. And now we know that fewer than 1%, if you look at a map of the whole country broken down by county, and where the death sentences and where the executions come from by county, we see that fewer than 1% of all the counties in this country have sent people to death row to be executed. Mm. Okay, and if you think about a, a system that's fair, and you know, a lot of people, when I was the director of Floridians for alternatives to the death penalty, you know, the politicians there, Jeb Bush was the governor then, uh, they would say, well, we're doing this for the victims' families. And if we have a commodity, for any subset of us, in this case, victim families, the death penalty execution is a commodity for them. What we're saying to the vast majority of victim family members is your loved one wasn't valuable enough because fewer than 1% of all the people who are eligible for the death penalty actually get a death sentence and stay on death row to the point of execution. So we have a system that's not equal or fair. Interesting. And carved into the face of the U.S. Supreme Court building are the words equal justice under law. And we don't have that. And uh, have you come to see it, um, I are you still at the point where if it was fair, if the federal government said, we're gonna fund any death penalty case that any county anywhere wants to bring, have, have, have your thoughts on the, the issue well, evolved? I'm glad you asked because that's the next part of my, my story is in, um, in 1993, I went on an event called The Journey of Hope from Violence to Healing, which was sponsored by a group called Murder Victim Families for Reconciliation, which is one of the groups in our movement. 
that is made up of murder victim family members who reject the death penalty. And that was a speaking tour through the state of Indiana, and it was led by victim family members, but joined by the families of people on death row and the families of the people who have been executed, and also people who are um, wrongly convicted and sent to death row. And meeting them and coming to understand their stories and these family members' stories, so not the killer and the victim, but the people around them, the collateral damage of the death penalty and understanding that is what moved my heart. So the facts and this fairness issue changed my head. Meeting the people and understanding the collateral damage of the death penalty moved my heart. And now, especially, I didn't even get this for a long time, but there's, we've come to understand something called um, uh, secondary trauma, which is what happens to people that clean up murder scenes, mm. people like prosecutors and judges and defense attorneys and everyone officers. involved in actually executing the execution. Well, uh, well, the executioners too. So, whenever, whenever something's happening, like my friend Bill Pelkey, who led that journey of hope from violence to healing in Indiana, his grandmother was murdered, and he supported the 15-year-old girl who did that getting the death sentence. She was the youngest female on death row in the country at the time, back when we executed juvenile offenders. Um, and you know, he would talk about how every time the case would come up, the picture, they, they would put up, um, not a picture, a beautiful picture of his grandmother and what she looked like in life, but they would show the picture of her body being reeled out of the house that she was killed in. And he talks about how that re-traumatized him. But onto the wardens, we now have among us, you know, the, the executive director of our California affiliate, Death Penalty Focus in California, this woman named Jeannie Woodford. She used to be the warden of San Quentin. She executed four people. Um, and she's now the executive director of an organization working to abolish the death penalty in California. Um, we've got six or seven, or actually eight now, former executioners, former corrections officials who oversaw executions who are saying, this does not work for prison workers. You know, Ron McAndrew, who conducted the, the last electric chair executions in Florida and um, the first lethal injections as warden of, of uh, uh, Union Correctional and the uh, Florida State, what would, the one that they did the executions in. Sorry, I'm blanking on that. He, um, he talks about the prisoners that he killed visiting him in his dreams. I you know, they got together, the first action that this group of wardens did was prior to the execution of Troy Davis, they together wrote a letter that they sent to the Georgia uh, corrections officials basically saying, look, you should go back and ask the Board of Pardons to reconsider, but if they don't, then at least say to the workers in the prison, you do not have to participate in this execution because our experience is that the most haunting of executions are the ones where the prisoner has said, I'm not guilty. Okay. And, and even, so, uh, even in Louisiana, one last thing on this, in Louisiana just recently they passed unanimously a bill that allows prison workers to not participate in executions. I, I wasn't aware that you didn't have an option. Uh, I mean, that's... Well, in most places you don't, but I can tell you that's that... That's pretty stunning. Prison workers, you know, this people say, well, take away the TV, take away all the prisoners' rights. People don't get that making sure there are good and comfortable conditions in prison is what keeps prison workers safe. Right. And if you want to have a prison condition where we're treating a person worse than we would treat an animal, then you, know, you, you cannot be surprised when that person strikes back. And if you want to have people in a position where they can't strike back, you're talking about super segregation, and that is the most expensive type of incarceration. So you know, you have to give and take somewhere. Well, Abe, uh, we just have a minute left. Where where can people where can people go online to get involved? Uh, uh, well, most importantly, shoutingfromtherooftops.org is where you can take the pledge to, um, to, to, to end executions, to be involved in the movement. They'll sign you up. We'll be able to connect you to the state organization um, in the state that you live in. And that's what we really advocate is for people to be involved at the state level, moving legislation state by state, uh, because that's how we're going to end up getting rid of the death penalty is state by state. And if uh, someone has a, uh, a friend or a relative who's a supporter of the death penalty and they want to convince them, they want to show them facts, as to why uh, the death penalty doesn't work, uh, or find out what their what what their motivation is for supporting the death penalty, and then go and get the information that refutes it, and they can 
can find it on our webpage or the Death Penalty Information Center is really a great resource for all of us, deathpenaltyinfo.org. Uh, but that's really the, you know, the, here's the best part, the best news is this. We don't need to change anybody's minds. All we need is for the people who are with us to actually do something, to join our organization, to be active in their state, to contact your own legislators and say, I want you to abolish the death penalty in the state. If, if everybody who was with us did that, we'd be done. Well, uh, Abe Bonowitz, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure.